Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, Google recently announced a new IoT operating system called Android Things. And the idea is it will replace their existing uh, Internet of Things operating system called Brillo, and this time more emphasizing the compatibility with Android. Well, I've downloaded it, I've been using it on a Raspberry Pi 3, and I've discovered how it all works. So if you wanna know what is Android Things, please let me explain. So first, I kind of look what is Internet of Things. Now, it's basically any device that's connected to the internet and it's performing a job or a function for us. Now, while smartphones and laptops are connected to the internet, they kind of connect to the internet because we're using them as tools. But an IoT device is something that's more autonomous. It stays on its own doing data gathering and doing tasks that we've assigned it to do without very much human interaction. So take the example of a weather station. Maybe it's out in a field somewhere and it's taking different sensor readings and it's sending those back up into the cloud for analysis. Now that doesn't just mean weather stations, we can talk about home automation, we can talk about home security, we can talk about smart cities, we can talk about sort of factories and power plants and all these kind of things that have kind of autonomous aspects to them and they're using the internet to send up the data to monitor what's going on. So it's really, it's sensors that are then sending up data into the cloud where we then analyze the information. Now, of course, we haven't really even come to fully understand all the different areas of which this idea of connected devices can work in our, in our lives. Street lamps, cars, fridges, refrigerators, you know, everything that we can think of can be connected to the internet if it can do a useful task. Now, to build those products, there has to be an element of computing power inside those devices. So that's why you need a computer, a chip, and you need an operating system, and it needs to have internet connectivity. So Google have released Android Things with the idea that they are gonna want people to use the technology built on Android, the knowledge they have of Android, the knowledge they have of Java to build IoT devices. Now, of course, it has to have a hardware component because we're talking about devices here. And what Google have done, they've supported three boards from the start and there are more boards coming along the way. And those three boards are the Intel Edison, which is obviously an Intel x86 chip. We've got the X, uh, NXP Pico, which is an ARM Cortex A7 based chip. And we've got the Raspberry Pi 3, which uses a quad core Cortex A53 chip, that's 64 bits. So as you can see here, we've got support for uh, Intel processors and for ARM processors. We've got 32 bit support and 64 bit support. All the devices come with at least half a gigabyte of memory and we're running at 500 megahertz or one gigahertz. Now that's quite different to the other types of IoT kits that we have, which are ones that are running on microcontrollers. Now microcontrollers run at very different speeds. They run at maybe only 96 megahertz or 48 megahertz. They might only have maybe uh, 256K of RAM or 128K of RAM. A very, very, very much smaller power requirements, much smaller hardware requirements. Now, Android things can't run on those because Android is, of course, based on Linux, and Linux is a full multitasking operating system with virtual memory support, which means you need a complicated MMU, memory management unit, and you only find those in things like the Cortex-A series and uh, Intel's uh, x86 series. Now this option to go with Android rather than with a microcontroller uh, type of design uh, could be a great benefit because we have such great powerful computers in our IoT devices, maybe things like voice recognition and maybe facial recognition and maybe kind of picture detection and sort of level of AI could happen in the IoT devices which would be very useful because we have such power there, but at the same time, it does raise the sort of the entry level. Do I really need a quad core uh, sort of one gigahertz processor in my fridge? So, you know, there is this kind of discrepancy. here. Now, Google are specifically aiming for one type part of the market with Android things, and it's missing out on a whole other part of the market. Now, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, only time will tell. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3, which really is a good idea that Google support this because it really is a very popular board. I wouldn't even know where to buy an Intel Edison board, but Raspberry Pis, I think I've got like five of them here in my house. So they really are the most popular platform for this kind of thing. 
And so the way it works is this, you download the image for the Raspberry Pi, you copy it onto an SD card, you boot up the, S the Raspberry Pi with that SD card, and you're instantly into Android things. Now during the boot up process, you kind of see at the beginning a few lines of boot up information, kind of reminiscent to a kind of a Linux machine booting up. And then after a few seconds, you get the splash screen, which shows you Android things booting up with a kind of a small uh, moving dots just to show that things are working. And then finally at the end, you just get the uh, Android uh, thing screen comes up, which does nothing. There's no user interface. It's just, this is meant to be a standalone device. It just sits there and tells you whether it has internet connectivity or not. That's all, that's all it does. But the real power comes when you start developing apps for it. Now to develop apps, you need to use Android Studio, at least Android Studio 2.2, and your SDK needs to be at least at level, API level 24, so that's kind of Android 7. Now once you have that, you can then start using Android things, and you can build an app in a very similar way to you build uh, an Android app. You've got the normal things, there's a manifest file, there's resource files for the layout written in XML, there's Java code in there, and very similar to the way you'd write an Android app, you write an Android Things app. And then once it's built, you connect over uh, the ethernet to the, uh, the board. When you've set that up before using ADB, you can kind of connect to it through ethernet or through Wi-Fi, and then you connect to that board and it kind of uploads, flashes the app onto your board. Now, once an app has been flashed on there, whenever you reboot it, it reboots directly into that app. Now, there are two types of uh, Android Things uh, applications. There are those with displays and there are those without displays. Now, the with display ones basically work in a very similar way to Android apps. You've got the normal layout that you do inside of uh, Android Studio. You've got the same UI toolkit that you get in uh, Android, and you can build device, uh, app, apps that run on these devices with a screen. But there's a few differences. There's no status bar at the top. There's no buttons, on-screen buttons to go back and forth. You just get the whole real estate is occupied by your app. And of course, that's going to be useful for maybe types of kiosks, for some types of products that have touch screens. People are going to want to be able to run this kind of user interface on their IoT device. But there are going to be lots of IoT devices that don't need a display at all. And so Android Things caters for that as well. You can write a device, an app, sorry, that has no uh, display whatsoever, but it does network things. It, it collects sensor data and it sends them up to the cloud. And all of the stuff that you get inside of Android, all of the access to the Google Cloud services, you can get with with an Android Things app that doesn't have a display. But of course, the one big difference between an Android smartphone and an Android Things board is that we also have access to the hardware. Now that means access to things like the different general purpose input output pins, and also to other types of buses and technologies, including I squared C, including uh, SPI, including serial ports, and those are all available inside of Android Things. So if you want to do pulse code modulation to control a servo, then Android Things knows how to do that already. If you want to talk to I squared C to a particular device, maybe to an LCD screen, then it, or Android Things already knows how to do that. If you want to talk uh, SPI to some non-volatile memory, then uh, Android Things already knows how to do that. So they've built in all that hardware support, the lowest level of hardware, so that you can talk to sensors and accelerometers and GPS units and all these kind of things and build an IoT product that is able to do complicated and useful things, including cameras, of course, and that leads to the whole possibility of things like facial recognition and object recognition and computer vision in general. So let me just show you a quick demo of what Android Things can do. This is a demo that Google provided. It shows us how to make a simple user interface, and it also shows us how Android Things can talk to hardware, in this case an LED, which we're gonna make switch on and off. So the device has now booted up, and here is this simple demo from Google. It shows a picture of a board in the middle of the screen, and over on the right-hand side there are little switches that allow you to turn the different GPIO pins on and off. Now the LED I've got connected is connected to GPIO 21. And over here we can see we've got a mouse. You can use a touch screen as well if you've got touch screen hardware connected up to your board. And if I click here, you can see that the LED comes on. We click it, it goes off, click it, it goes on, click it goes off. And of course I could have many LEDs, many different inputs and outputs here that I can control manually. So this is showing us a graphical UI with Android things and control of hardware directly with Android Things. 
Now, at the moment, this is a developer preview that there is running on the uh, Raspberry Pi and the other boards, and it really is a preview because there are some big holes in Google's vision for Android things. The first and most obvious biggest hole is that there's no deployment mechanism at the moment. What do I mean by that? At the moment, if you want to talk to the board, you have to set things up using ADB, you have to connect to the board, and then you kind of flash things over, and then ADB kind of sometimes disconnects, and there's a whole problem I found with it kind of disconnecting after a few minutes. And if you want to set up Wi-Fi, you kind of type in this complicated command, which for a developer is not so bad, but for a user would never would never work at all for them to kind of uh, kind of get the Wi-Fi connection up and running. Now, Google need to have a deployment system. Uh, either means a generic app that can work with all Internet of Things boards that they just say, here's our Internet of Things con control app and you kind of find your device and you can kind of do lots of things with a nice user interface on your mobile phone or they need to release the source code for a generic app that people can tailor for their particular Internet of Things device because at the moment there's no way of handling that process at all. So you can't actually ship a product yet that's usable by a, a consumer at the, at the end level. Now the other problem is that Google really have set the system requirement quite high. By opting for kind of Android and Linux and a complicated CPU, they really have set the entry level higher than maybe some IoT developers would like. We're talking like half a gigabyte of RAM here and that's, that's, that costs money. We're talking about a complicated processor that costs money, much, much different to the prices of the low end microcontroller boards. Now, whether that's the right decision or not, we'll find out in the future. Google are really betting that the technology of Android and the people's knowledge of Android, developers' knowledge of, of, of Java will be the key selling point that people say, well, I can take that same experience. In fact, I can take some of the same code that I've already got and I can use it directly in my new IoT product. And they're banking that that really is the way people are going to think. I'm not sure that's gonna be true, but time will be the judge of that. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this quick overview of Android things. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. Download the Android Authority app because that will give you access to all of our news and features directly on your mobile phone. And last but not least, don't forget to go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android. <laughs>